everyone, this is Charles, host of the Detroit Metro Plug podcast, where connections matter, where I bring you podcast interviews of Detroit difference makers in the area of community involvement and entrepreneurship. And I'm excited about this evening's podcast, this evening's show. Uh, we have a very special guest, a, a Detroit difference maker um, that's going to be on our podcast today. Uh, let me read a little bit of information about our next guest. Um, our next guest is the founder and CEO of Izzy LLC, which leaves people, places, and things better than we found them. This is a um, environmental justice uh, business uh, focuses on sustainability consulting to universities, corporations, and organizations to uplift to uplift the needs of black, brown, and marginalized communities. As caretakers of shared public space, our, their subscription strategic beautification addresses the grounds, maintenance needs for community corridors, retail, academic, corporate, and religious campuses. Their services begin with litter, yet includes consulting regarding environmental stewardship. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm excited for our next guest who is in, uh, involved in um, eco justice, sustainability solutions, anti litter, and beautification strategies. Ladies and gentlemen, let's walk, welcome our next guest, Audra Carlson. Yes, 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 yes. Charles, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here and get reacquainted. We used to cross paths at Tech Town, uh, Green Garage and events around town. So I'm excited to be on your show. Congratulations on your podcast. Thank you, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, so yeah, I um, call myself Chief Beautification Strategist. Uh, okay. That's kind of a tongue in cheek uh, because part of what I do is I pick up litter and debris uh, along community corridors. Uh, the company is named in honor of my mother. Okay. Uh, Izzy was my mom's name. Um, and actually, Charles, uh, this work uh, found me. Um, when, I'm, when I met you, I think I was working with D-Tread and cleaning up tires and that sort of thing. So Izzy is a, another iteration of that business. Uh, but um, thinking back, uh, my mom and my dad were both community advocates. And so... Um, I started um, watching them, you know, at, I have the memory of being five years old and um, helping with the political campaign. So um, this work is in my DNA uh, and um, it's a compulsion uh, for me to uplift space, you know, where um, marginalized and black and brown people live uh, and want to thrive. And so the work that I do, I believe, helps, uh, helps to allow them to get back to thriving. Okay, that, that's awesome. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, before we go into detail um, mm -hmm. about your, your your work and your service in our community, mm -hmm. uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, where you grew up, uh, maybe what schools you went to uh, before you got into what sure. you're doing. Sure, sure, sure. Born and raised, city of Detroit. Been here my whole life with the exception of college. So I attended Cordes Elementary School, Noble Elementary Middle School, and Cass Technical High School. I uh, attended Olivet College uh, in Olivet, Michigan, and I have been back home ever since. Um, I've been, you know, a supporter and a, a promoter of Detroit. You know, it's, it's um, just tattooed on my heart and brain and soul uh, to make, make Detroit, Detroit better and Detroit shine. Now, um... How did you, what was your path in getting involved uh, with um, eco-justice and uh, sustainability? So um, Izzy's big sister uh, is an organization called D-Tread. And I started D-Tread in 2009 uh, with the goal of um, providing and, and creating products out of recycled rubber. Uh, when I began, I, I learned some startling um, astonishing, troubling facts about uh, post-consumer tires. 
Uh, and it's a global problem. And I felt like coming from Detroit, Detroit being the motor capital of the world, um, that some solutions could come from Detroit through me. And so I, I started down that path. Um, but but Charles, you know, I just I went to college business at business administration degree um, from Olivet College, and uh, this work just found me. You know, um, I saw a problem. And my parents have always instilled in my brothers and I, um, you're either part of the problem or the solution. And we've always chosen to be part of the solution. And so uh, I started DTRED and then um, DTRED has been put on the shelf and it morphed into you know, cleanliness, maintenance and cleaning up litter and trash, uh, you know, kind of being snarky toward litter bugs and um, you know, doing this work doing this work to uplift space, uh, which is even more important now um, as we come through COVID and the pandemic, you know, public shared space is even more um, important now than ever, uh, at least in our lifetime. So, yeah. Okay. Now, is there a certain uh, uh, spaces that you focus on? Is it just uh, targeting black and brown communities or is it, in the metro area or so so you know the work started you know my my first big client was live six livernoy mcnichols which mcnichols is affectionately called six mile so uh that was my biggest client lauren hood assisted me with uh coming up with my proposal for that we we worked in that area for three years uh with a cleanliness maintenance program uh yet you know, as you alluded to, Charles, uh, Metro Detroit um, has a has a trash problem, a litter problem, and so uh, with expansion, hopes hopes of expansion, um, I plan to be able to uh, provide service to commercial um, strips in Metro Detroit, uh, border you know border entering suburbs who have um, you know they've had some issues with declining tax base and all of that, and so I'd like to be able to help them um, with our services to uplift those residents who you know are still in those communities and and want to thrive as well. Okay, okay, um, that's great that uh, you start. So you started with uh, Lift Six uh, mm -hmm. that, that corridor on Six Mile and Livernoy. Mm -hmm. um, now. Um, in your initiatives, do you partner with other organizations or how do you, is that just, I'm assuming it's not a one person show. Uh, right. How do you uh, work with the neighborhood or other organizations to uh, do your initiatives? So I, I don't want to give away, uh, you know, I want people to buy my book that I'm going to be promoting. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, so um, part of this work, um, Charles, is workforce development. It's innate in this work. And so, you know, you take a, a older inner ring suburb, um, you know, transportation might may be a problem for uh, one of our teammates. Uh, we want to be able to, you know, provide service right there in the community by community members. Uh, it's important that uh, community see community members um, being good stewards of their of their space. And so um, with doing that, uh, it's a team. And so the goal is to be able to add to the team as we add to, you know, add communities, you know, add team members. Um, at, a, at my peak, um, I have four team members plus myself. It was five of us. And in that workforce development, there was a hypothesis on my end um, of what that workforce could look like. And so uh, we were able to employ, um, you know, the vulnerable part of our population. So. Uh, returning citizens, uh, elder, aging in place, formerly addicted, um, <clears throat> housewife. You know, we 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 were able to um, be very successful in that team and the way that the team worked. Um, so, looking forward to rebuilding uh, during the pandemic, uh, Charles. What happened? <clears throat> I started doing um, landscaping. Uh, and I shared those photographs on social media and I began to get inquiries, phone calls on the 800 number. Audra, I need your help. Come help. Right. So uh, another um, part of our services when we talk about 
beautification is landscaping, right? And so okay. um, residential uh, for people who, you know, normally would think that they cannot afford a landscaper and then um, on the commercial side. So, um, you know, helping uplift uh, corridor. So one of my successes, huge successes uh, was uh, the firehouse. I think it's firehouse 55 at exit nine on the Southfield freeway. Um, okay. I was enlisted by Cody Rouge, Kenyatta Peoples um, to uh, do that um, space uh, with, you know, the huge planters and, and all of that. And so I designed uh, and planted uh, on that corner of uh, Joy Road and Southfield Freeway. Uh, and so <clears throat> landscaping, you know, not necessarily grass cutting, but helping to, uh, you know, pick out plants, co-create, you know, color schemes with owners, uh, and, you know, again, uplift, uplift space. Uh, and then also we're going to be moving into uh, green stormwater infrastructure uh, as well. So, you know, all of it, it starts, you got to start with a clean slate. So get that litter and debris out of there. And then people can start imagining, you know, what those spaces can look like. Okay. Yeah. Um, I found it interesting. Um, you mentioned about uh, your pivoting during COVID, mm -hmm. um, where you kind of ventured off um, in landscaping, mm -hmm. but still staying true to your core core mission of beautification, creating um, clean and um, safe spaces. Mm -hmm. um, now, how was that transition? Uh, did people get kind of confused about what you did, or what was that? Uh, how did that work out? So they they it so it fell fell in line, and so you know. Um, some team members helped me with telling the story in social media, you know, yet, as you stated, I've stayed true to, you know, just wanting to make spaces beautiful. So it just added to, a, you know, a different type of space to make beautiful. So, you know, backyards, front yards, um, you know, spaces where um, people are doing things in community. Mama Shu over at Avalon Village. Uh, you know, working with her, she's one of my clients. And so, um, you know, it just fit. And because uh, the world had become strange um, and people, you know, people weren't working and, and all of that stuff for various reasons, and there's no d judgment in that. Um, yet, you know, I had to sustain myself um, and it was therapy, you know. So, you know, being outside, working in the dirt, um, is, is very healing. Uh, and so, you know, it just worked out. And so now, you know, back to corridor cleanliness, uh, and then now, you know, the landscaping is just an added service. So it's really worked out to the benefit of, of me and for the benefit of the company. That's wonderful. That's wonderful that you were able to expand your services, not just in commercial spaces, but residential. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, uh, what do you think, um, and particularly in the, um, the Detroit areas, and you mentioned Live 6, mm -hmm. uh, Livernois and Six Mile, what do you think are some of the problems that contribute to litter and things not being as uh, in, their, in their best form that they should be? What do you think contributes to that? So, so Charles, you know, I don't, I don't know if we're friends on Facebook, so I, I kind of, you know, have my little snarky memes. Uh, when I talk about trashy people. Uh, yet, um, you know, there are a few things that contribute to that, right? So we have about maybe at least two generations that have not been taught that littering is bad. Uh, you know, when we may be in the same age group, you and I, Charles, I may be a little older than you, but, um, you know, growing up in between the commercials, I mean, in between the cartoons, there were commercials that talked about, you know, PSAs that talked about littering was bad, you know, um, give a hoot, don't pollute, you know, the terms litter bug, you know, were, were developed during that time. Um, that uh, Native American with the tear coming down his face with a landfill of, of trash and pollution behind him. Those things were, you know, um, you know, embedded into us, you know, we watched Saturday morning cartoons, there were reminders also in school. So that PSA had a companion poster 
that was in school that talked about littering was bad um, and be good to mother earth and don't pollute and all of that. And so it may even be almost three generations that have not had that um, layer of education, you know, that space is finite. Uh, you know, you litter, I litter, everybody's litter, everybody litters, then, you know, we, we're all going to be living in a trash heap. So, um, so it's that, it's the education, but also, um, Charles, people have gotten really selfish. And so um, during the pandemic, you could see it. So normally spaces that wouldn't have litter, um, they had a new type of litter and it was kind of okay for people. They come out the grocery store, they're uncomfortable, they're, they're mad because they didn't want to wear you know, the, 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 uh, the mask or whatever, or maybe not mad, but as soon as they hit the parking lot, there it, there it goes, um, you know, on the ground, blue gloves uh, on the ground. And so in those instances, people became selfish. My comfort, my convenience outweighs anybody else's. And so, you know, forget the, the possibility of, you know, this being biohazard waste, um, even if they, you know, you know, coughing and, you know, all of that stuff. And so not thinking about the people who, you know, would be responsible for, you know, cleaning that stuff up. So, um, you know, those are two major things uh, that has caused, um, you know, and then consumption, right? So we just buy, 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 buy. We buy food we may not like. We don't like the food. We don't take it home um, and put it in the trash. We throw it out the window. Um, you know, just consumer, 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 consumer. We're consumers. And then, you know, when we're done with it, you know, throw it out the window, which is just ridiculous and crazy. So. Oh, OK. All right. Mm -hmm. You mentioned a, a few things. I remember, um, like you said, the public service announcements do cartoons and ad campaigns. Mm -hmm. And I remember that uh, uh, give a hoot, don't pollute. Right. Um, and just seeing, being reinforced that uh, no be a litter bug and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And um, so the education is a piece. Um, mm -hmm. And then you talked about uh, just people's attitudes and being selfish uh, as a result mm -hmm. during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think has happened to uh, why is there any, no more of those type of cartoons or I'm not sure if they have announcements or anything on social media about littering and, uh, and can't, I don't see any, I mean, as far as I know, right. I haven't seen anything on TikTok or right. Instagram about, you right. know, no campaign, you know, could do a different spin on it on, mm -hmm. on not being a polluter. Um, uh, have you seen it? Is there anything out there that you know of, or that, not that I'm aware of? And actually, I'm working on something. Um, I have two nephews that are very gifted. Um, one nephew has, since the age of about eight, he said he's going to be a filmmaker, and so he has his own company. Uh, and so I saw him yesterday on Easter, and I asked him to help me. So through Izzy, um, there will be public service announcements that will come out. Um, that talk about, uh, you know, don't be a litter bug, you know, anti-litter campaign will be coming out. It'll roll out within probably the next 30 to 45 days. So I'm really excited about that. Really excited about it. Okay. So uh, you're involved with um, uh, a campaign to bring awareness. That's great. Yes. That's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, curious, do you see um, in some areas in Detroit in particular, is the issue not enough uh, trash receptacles or places where, because I find sometimes some neighborhoods, you don't, you know, in a commercial space, you want to throw trash away somewhere right. you to find a place to throw it at. Right. Is that, have you find that to be an issue or? Oh yeah. You know? Oh yeah. That's a, that's a big issue. That's a big issue. Uh, and you know, so if you're a pedestrian and you, you've gotten yourself some chips and, you know, a soda or whatever, a pop, um, you know, you're walking down the street and, you know, there's very, it's a high probability you don't have anywhere to put it, you know, so that's another part of the problem as well. And so I consult with organizations and municipalities and, um, you know, commercial 
uh, spaces regarding types of trash cans, where placement, um, you know, so yeah, you know, is is getting to those is getting to those answers, Charles. You know, okay. um, you know, having a conversation. You know, I I didn't think um, I would be nerding out talking about trash cans and all of that <laughs> stuff. And so, you know, but all of it is connected, right? And so, okay. yeah, for sure. Now, is some of the challenge if if there are spaces that have trash cans, do they have to have the manpower to make sure they are emptied and service, or is that is that that's, why that that's means? A, that's another that's another piece? And so, you know, for for the service that we provide, you know, trash cans and the maintenance of those trash receptacles, right? Um, you know, manpower is, is an issue. I mean, that for, and manpower for municipalities is an issue. Um, and so I, I, I know that I'm a solution for municipalities. Okay. Um, you know, um, they, ca they contract all types of work out. Uh, and so work can be contracted out to us to do that type of work where, okay. you know, they don't necessarily have the manpower in order to do it. Um, it may not be as robust as if the municipality is doing it, yet it's there and it's an option for, um, okay. you know, the residents and those who, you know, may be visiting, right? Mm -hmm. uh, visitor experience, you know, you're crossing over into, um, you know, over the line to go into a city. Visitor experience makes a difference, right? So, you know, when you're driving into that city, you know, you want to, to show your best, your best self, you know, um, as a community to that, that visitor, right? Um, right, right. You know, people stay longer and spend more money when they are in spaces that are litter free and have greenery and all of that stuff. So, you know, it, it helps the economy uh, for right. spaces to, to be, you know, to be clean. So, yeah. Right, right. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what would you say your, your company, how, what role does it play um, with regards to sustainability, um, using Live Six as a as a as an example, um, mm -hmm. how would you contribute to sustainability in that corridor? Right. So sustainability. Uh, so with DTRED, um, the goal was to have uh, my own version of a permeable uh, rubberized asphalt, and so um, Detroit DTRED 2.0. That's what it'll be. It'll be a product that can be utilized um, in green infrastructure. Okay. okay. Um, you know, there are certain types of plantings um, where, you know, rain gardens, uh, bioswells, those type okay. of things. Um, when, you, when you utilize those, you know, in addition to other things, mm -hmm. um, you know, you offset some of the perils of, uh, you know, the, the um, climate, rapid climate change. So, you know, there's a such, such thing as urban heat islands. So okay. when you have spaces that um, lack tree covering, lack green, um, green space, though, because the earth is getting hotter, our summers are getting hotter, right? And so that asphalt heats up, right? And right. it's no covering and people live closely in, in community, right? And so that urban heat island has a negative impact on the lifestyle and well-being of people who live in these communities. And so talking with uh, decision makers in community and municipalities about reforestation, um, you know, bringing trees back, also being thoughtful in the type of trees. Uh, so the things that happened in the past won't happen in the future. So being a more diverse in the type of trees that may be planted, not all one type, you know, so that we don't have, you know, a, a, a disease that, you know, goes throughout the whole tree community and wipes out those trees. So being thoughtful and talking about those uh, types of things, um, you know, that's part of the sustainability. Also, um, having climate readiness, right? So those who have been hit hard multiple times with flooding, um, you know, having conversations about doing things differently um, when, when repair and replace happens, um, there are some things that, you know, can be talked about, you know, doing things differently, not continuing doing the same way and then 
a catastrophe happens and then there has to be replacement. Maybe doing something differently, right? Um, to, to strengthen that, that household so that it'll be much better prepared um, to withstand some of the things that come with climate change. Okay. Okay. Uh, that's great. Uh, there's, you, you've offered up some um, good examples of uh, ways that uh, uh, neighborhoods can participate in um, uh, sustainability or eco-friendly um, practices mm -hmm. or uh, different options there. Mm -hmm. uh, how has the uh, city of Detroit embraced some of these? Uh, I'm not sure if you've worked with city council or, or uh, local district uh, council districts or or anyone's from the mayor office about some of these initiatives that you're you're suggesting. So I am open, and I look forward to talking with the city of Detroit. It would be um, an absolute answered prayer and a dream come true to be. You know, to work along other Detroiters and, um, you know, provide some of the solutions to, you know, legacy residents, people who have been here the whole time, um, who have been hit really hard uh, with, um, you know, environmental issues. Uh, so I'm, I'm open to talk. I had the honor of being a sustainability ambassador for District 2 uh, when the sustainability agenda was being rented, rent written and um, developed. And so I had the honor of that um, uh, to be part of it. It was exciting. And uh, again, I avail myself uh, you know, to the city and I would love to work alongside the city you know, to move us forward as we talk about you know, making Detroit vibrant for generations to come. So, yep. Okay, well, that's, that's good. I hope that you uh, we'll continue to have those conversations, uh, particularly with uh, uh, city council and other leaders in the mayor's office. And mm -hmm. I wasn't aware that you were, uh, are, do you st are you still an ambassador for district two or? So that was um, in the early phase. So that was the, um, in the development of what the agenda would entail and include. And so, um, you know, that was like in the very first phase. Okay. So that was, um, you know, I had a beginning and an end date um, mm -hmm. for my um, participation with that. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Now, if you had your way, what would a envir uh, environmental friendly neighborhood in Detroit look like to you? An environmental, environmentally friendly neighborhood would look like um, a variety of trees. So you know, down the residential streets, there would be trees. Um, it would be a diverse trees. Um, on the corners, there would be plantings of some type of perennial or shrubbery, you know, on those corners to, that's gonna help abs absorb, you know, the water from, from torrential rains. Okay. Um, clean storm drains. Mm -hmm. uh, and so maintenance of the storm drains um, <clears throat> so that while we're waiting on um, the infrastructure to be replaced, uh, what we have, those um, storm drains are looked after and not necessarily the whole onus is on um, the homeowner or mm -hmm. the person who's renting. Mm -hmm. um, the, the corridors themselves, I envision the return of, of commerce retail. Right. So, um, you know, little shops, you know, um, dry cleaners, all of the things that people would need. It doesn't matter, you know, social economic, you know, people need to be able to have certain things that they could walk to. Right. Okay. So that walkability, seeing people walk, the more densely, you know, populated with people who are walking, you know, the perception is things are, you know, safe and then, you know, things are it's a well-oiled machine, right? Okay. And so with the, that pedestrian traffic, benches for people to sit on, um, you know, choices for people to buy coffee or if they want a, a juice, they can sit and just relax and breathe, Okay. right? Um, right. Trash receptacles, little planters, okay. um, you know, trees, a certain type of tree that would be on a, 
a, a, a boulevard as opposed to a residential, you know, so something that's not necessarily going to block mm. sight line for store owners. Okay. Um, uh, you know, maybe some music playing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, music uh, uh -huh. coming out coming out of the stores. You know, right, uh, right. a record shop. You know, a flower shop. Okay. Uh, you know, um, bikes. You know, kids with bikes. Right. Okay. Um, kids that ride the bike up to the corner to do something, and right. they they put their bike in the in the in in the bike holder. Right, kids. Right. Uh, giggling, you know, <laughs> hearing children giggle, mm -hmm. right, in community. Yeah. Um, the smell of different types of ethnic food. Okay. Being cooked and, you know, people are just, you know, they're able to work and able to, to, to you know, buy, they're able to provide their needs and have some of their wants right in a local way. Wow. Uh, you painted a really good picture of a, of a neighborhood you, that you thought was environmentally friendly, mm -hmm. sustainable. Uh, I liked how you included not just the um, visual of, of greenery and plants and uh, things that would absorb rain and, and good storm drains. You also talked about the, the feel, the, the vibe, the sounds of kids giggling and music and, and the smell of ethnic, ethnic foods. I think that's awesome. What do you think are some of the barriers to creating um, the things you just shared? Um, is it financial? Is it? Uh, uh, so yeah, it I know, I know yeah. the big infrastructure bill has passed. I don't know if there's resources set aside for some of the stuff you're talking about. Um, I pray that it is. And I pray that it gets to, um, you know, small business owners such as myself and, and, and others who, you know, want to do some things and, and use their, you know, they're aligned with their purpose and they want to bring excellence to community, just like they bring excellence everywhere else. Um, some of the barriers, Charles, financial, you know, that's, that's really a big one. And so I've had a conversation um, recently about, you know, legacy. Um, business owners in the city of Detroit, you know, own businesses and, you know, how they've weathered so many different types of storms. Uh, and, you know, the unimaginable with the pandemic and COVID, you know, what happened with some of those businesses. So those that are still here, uh, you know, there there's a strategic neighborhood initiative, you know, that's being worked on um, to provide some cohesiveness to, uh, you know, some of these commercial corridors. And um, I'm, I'm hoping that you know, there's some focus groups that are happening around, you know, what can what can happen for those spaces. Um, talking, being able to talk again and communicate and talk about what the needs are and how can we address those needs to strengthen, stabilize what's there, and then also attract, you know, new businesses and new, uh, you know, uh, families or individuals who'd like to you know, be business owners in the city of Detroit along corridor. So, okay. So, okay. So, you um, clearly describe some of the barriers, and hopefully, um, we can overcome some of those. And mm -hmm. um, now, uh, if you don't mind me asking, um, some neighborhoods uh, within the last five years got bike uh, bike lanes. Um, uh, I could think of uh, Rosedale Park, and I'm not sure. Do they put bike lanes in the uh, Live Six? Yes. Area? Okay. Mm -hmm. Some people there was some pushback um, from a, from that. Uh, you know, if they felt that it it caused possibly more tr uh, driver traffic in automobiles. Mm -hmm. What's your thoughts on um, the whole um, bike lanes that were downtown on Jefferson, Grand River, and Six Mile? So they they are troublesome. So you you have to you 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 addressing and you're in, well you're introducing something totally different to people who have been driving their whole lives. So you know you have this added lane between the curb and then the you know the whatever those reflectors are 
you know, and then it's parking. Um, there's a whole education that has to happen around that. Is is dangerous? Um, it's dangerous for the motorists. Um, it pits the motorists against the bikers, um, which is extremely unfortunate because everybody is just trying to get to from point A to point B. Um, it's it's you know taking out lanes on streets that people use to go from east to west uh, is troublesome. Um, you know, traffic jams on streets that normally wouldn't have traffic jams because uh, lanes have been taken out is, is troublesome. Um, so, you know, I have friends who, you know, are bikers and, you know, they belong to the bike clubs and all of that. And, you know, it's something that has, is growing and, you know, and has been growing at the same time. It's, it's just unfortunate because it just, you know, McNichols, um, is different. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's different and more, it's going to be more dense because the, you know, it's apartment complex that's going on there's going to be built over there and <clears throat> some other things. And so, you know, um, you know, they're here to stay, it appears. Wow. Uh, yet, um, it's just, it's just been unfortunate because it's just caused, um, it's caused a lot of, uh, pressure on, you know, folks that's just trying to get from A to B. Right, you know? right, right, right. You know? So, uh, I mean, I think the whole thought was to try to pr promote, uh, you know, uh a more health people transporting maybe reduce uh, uh use of cars because mm -hmm. you ride a bike mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. it's healthier and mm -hmm. opportunity to reduce possible carbon emissions whatever right um but and, you know I, I like what you shared that i guess the way it was done it was troublesome when people are used to um you know just getting to point a to point b by driving and mm -hmm. and uh maybe communities were not biking communities per se, mm -hmm. uh, but what was, the, I'm, I always was curious. I don't know what was the thoughts behind it. Were you privy to some of these initiatives or, or you were never consulted probably? I, I'm not no, you know, I, I got invited to a couple meetings or whatever, you know, yeah, you know, more than likely the decisions were already made. Oh, okay. Um, okay. One, one thing is unfortunate, you know, I go back to, you know, people who have been here. So there's an elder, um, who shared a story on social media. Uh, she is a business owner. She is a, um, her, her family has owned the business over 70 years. And one of her clients uh, was leaving to go to her vehicle. And um, a gentleman began to um, verbally attack this elder person about a bike lane. And that's one incident that was shared, yet I'm sure that there have been many others. You know, this person, an adult man feeling emboldened to admonish an elder um, about a bike lane. Um, and this person was yelling at the elder. Uh, that's disturbing. It's extremely disturbing. Okay. Uh, the respect, you know, you, we, we have to uh, acknowledge the humanity in one another. Okay, so as a biker, as someone who rides a bicycle, you are not more important than an elder who is in a vehicle. And it has to be some type of way in which to communicate and, and communicate in a way that is civil and respectful. And right. so, you know, that, like I said, is one story. I'm sure there have been right. others who believe that they are superior to people who are in a vehicle and, and just adjusting and trying to get from point A to point B. Right, so, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, and as you said uh, earlier, that the, the appear, obviously the bike lanes are here to stay and mm -hmm. hopefully um, everyone can make an adjustment uh, to that. Um, mm -hmm. as, we're, as we're um about to wrap things up, um, I would like to know how would you best describe in a, in a sentence or a phrase, or if there's one word, uh, your business, what would be the what would be that phrase or word or sentence? 
So the one word would be humanity. Humanity, okay. Humanity. Um, and then the phrase is that, you know, again, we leave people places and things better than we found them. So, you know, that's uplifting people, right? Acknowledging the humanity in people. Place by starting off with just cleaning it up. And then things, you know, just wanting to be, you know, part of a good system of people who work together, collaborate in a positive way and, you know, want to wrap our arms around you know, people who may be having a difficult time and, and not judge that uh, and just, you know, assist people along their way. Right. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> who would you say is your your best client that you work with? Oh, wow. You know what what was interesting uh, when I post on social media, um, I say my favorite client. Right. So I use the hashtag my favorite client. They all are because they all bring so much to me. They trust me, you know, to have someone trust, uh, trust me to come into their space at their home, right? Mm -hmm. Be it their front yard or their backyard, to have community trust me in, in their corridor. You know, Boston Edison is one of my clients to trust me to bring excellence, you know, to you know, making sure that their corridors are, you know, litter and debris free and, you know, reporting back what I see. So if it's some societal things that I see based on the forensics of, you know, what we pick up, I report that back, you know, because we are our brothers, our sisters, our children's, our mother, our father's keepers, right? We, we are our neighbor's keepers. So right. if it's something out there, you know, that a potential homeless situation or something like that is reported back to the client. So they're all my best and they're all my favorite. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, if someone wants to work with you, what's the best way they can get in touch with you? Okay. So they can call the phone number 866-97-IZZY. That is 866-974-9943. They can call that number um, when after hours, of course, it's, uh, you know, they can leave message, a message. Um, they can connect with me on Facebook. Izzy LLC is the Facebook page. Instagram, Izzy LLC is the um, Instagram page. And then if they'd like to email me, info, I-N-F-O dot Izzy LLC at gmail.com. Okay. That's awesome. So uh, those who are viewing this podcast um, and you're interested in her work um, and learning more about uh, how your space or community can be beautified and or incorporated some sustainability uh, practices, uh, you can reach Audra at uh, her social uh, media handles at Izzy, uh, is Izzy LLC yes. on Instagram and Facebook. And yes. then um, you also shared your phone number and email. Mm -hmm. And we'll have those information in our show notes uh, for those who will be viewing that. So in our YouTube show notes, we'll have her phone number that she just mentioned, mm -hmm. her email and her social media handles. Do you have any um, announcements of events or things that your initiatives that you're uh, that a part of that's coming up? So um, I'm not sure when this is going to air, but we are doing a cleanup for Earth Day. Um, that is April 22nd. Um, the flyer is on the social media pages. Uh, we will be cleaning up around Central Woodward, uh, Detroit, which is mid west side of Detroit, well, mid Detroit. Uh, and then also my book, my book is, I'm finishing up my book, Litter, Laughter, and Soul Lucians. That's Soul, S O U L, Lucians. Um, I'm excited about the book, um, and it should be coming out in the fall and um you'll learn a little bit you'll laugh a little bit and then you'll get some some detail about some of the work that i've been doing around uh southeast michigan okay and 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 um where could uh people uh purchase your book when it comes out is it uh... um so it'll be on it'll be on the izzy um uh, Instagram pages. There'll be a link for that. Um, also, there's a new website, AudraDCarson.com, that is coming out specifically around 
Um, you know, some of the work that I do is, is it relates to consulting. Um, the book can be purchased on that website as well. And then also the Izzy, the Izzy uh, website also. Okay. So we look forward to your book. Um, and uh, now, do you need volunteers for your Earth Day or how does that... Uh... So, you know, if some people could come out, that would be great. Um, if they're interested, you know, the phone number, they could call the phone number, which is 866-974-9943, or uh, message me through the social media. Um, we definitely could love to have, you know, love to have a few people. We're going to be out from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, and, you know, light work, you know, this time of year, we're going to get it done, um, deploy to a couple different spots and, you know, get the work done and, you know, maybe go have a coffee or something to warm up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're still in April, so you never know what the, the April what is going to be here in Michigan. Right. Um, any any uh, final words words as we wrap things up? Uh, Charles McKay, I just want to thank you, sir. Thank you for the invite. You know, there was a little delay in me getting back to you. Um, no I appreciate the invite. I appreciate the work that you're doing, um, helping Detroiters, Metro Detroiters, um, tell their stories and uh, allow people to connect with their businesses. So it's very important work. And so um, I'm grateful to you. Uh, continued success uh, for you. And then uh, Metro Detroit and those who are outside of this region, you know, I send you peace and love and blessings uh, and, you know, just wishing people well and, you know, wanting people to be healed and healing and, you know, feeling good coming out of what we've been through the last two and a half, almost three years. Okay. Well, I certainly appreciate your time and sharing your passion and your vision. And I uh, applaud you in the work that you're doing in the area of uh, beautification, environment, eco-friendly, mm -hmm. uh, eco-friendly spaces, sustainability, mm -hmm. and the work you're doing in, in, in the city. Um, I applaud you and thank you uh, for being here. And I'm just honored to uh, have you share your story and uh, hope this will inspire other people. Um, and, and, and I w wish you well for the um, campaign. Um, when you talked about those campaigns, yeah, when you were young about uh, uh, give a hoot, don't pollute, uh, right? And all those things. And uh, I hope that uh, wish you success because you know, uh, we are becoming more conscious of the climate change, and mm -hmm. uh, there's things that we need to do, uh, real quickly to curb the, the warming of the planet and um, your role in our communities are very important. So I applaud you and thank you again for uh, sharing your story. My pleasure, my pleasure, Charles. Well, that concludes our uh, podcast interview. I thank our guests again. Uh, for those who are viewing, um, we'll have again our notes in the, uh, in the show notes, how you can connect with our guests through email, phone number, and social media. If you found value in this podcast, I encourage you to uh, leave a comment, like, and subscribe, and share this podcast with your friends. Uh, we're about Connections Matter. Um, we're about connecting people with resources, opportunity, and information. And um, we try to bring you interviews of Detroit difference makers in the area of entrepreneurship and community involvement. Thanks for watching this podcast, and don't forget to like and subscribe.